just because it's Korea and we love coming to this conference, um, but also because we happen to be passionate about legal ethics and about running a modern law firm. So this is basically our favorite topic ever <laughs> to be talking to you. So yeah, so let's start. Let's do it. So today what we're going to talk about is we're going to start by um, highlighting all those moments that practitioners are confronted with on a daily basis where we brush up against legal ethics, but we don't always knowingly do so. And it can be very challenging for practitioners to sort of parse what to do in those moments. So we're going to start first like sort of in the weeds of, hey, where are these moments surfacing in our everyday practice? We're going to move into how are lawyers and legal companies innovating around and problem solving around some of the legal ethics that really do uh, keep us from building the businesses and moving forward in a way that we want. So to start, we're going to start with one of my favorite examples of legal ethics mishaps. And this happens to be uh, Professor Lawrence Tribe of Harvard Law School, for those of you who don't know him. He's a very prolific tweeter. You should definitely follow him on Twitter. Uh, back in the summer of 2016, August, right before the election, he loved to tweet, as everybody did, about the election. This particular tweet got him into a lot of trouble. He said, I have notes of when Trump phoned me for legal advice in 1996. I'm now figuring out whether our talk was privileged. So after he posts this, he obviously has a lot of followers. Basically, Twittersphere, the Twittersphere blew up. Does anybody here want to identify what they think the problem was with this tweet? Yeah. That's right. He shouldn't be telling, he shouldn't be even mentioning the fact that uh, Trump would have reached out to him. So, of course, Twitter blows up, the blogosphere blows up, Wall Street Journal is reporting on it. And what do they have to say? Well, they actually get a quote from a law school professor, not quite as uh, well known as Harvard Law School. And he probably delighted in this opportunity to talk about what Lawrence Tribe did wrong. And he said, the issue is not at all whether Professor Tribe's notes are protected by attorney-client privilege. No one, to my knowledge, has subpoenaed Tribe's notes. Rather, the issue, to be more precise, one of several issues here, is whether the notes are confidential. Privilege is an evidentiary issue. Confidentiality is an ethical issue. Tribe's problem is now one of ethics, not of evidence. And just to dig the knife in like a little bit deeper and just twist it, Tribe's pro uh, all law students and lawyers should know this. And while that is probably true, we all should know that confidentiality covers all of the information that we get from a case regardless of its source, not just when our client's talking to us. The fact of the matter is, Lawrence Tribe is not alone. Many lawyers struggle with these kinds of basic notions, especially now that we're bringing our practices online. And we're all of a sudden talking and being pushed to talk about our practices in a way that we never had to before. Okay, so here's one of the, the daily things that we confront is, Attorneys are violating the rules every day, and for the most part, they don't know. And more problematic is we're social beings, right? We're not making our decisions about legal ethics based upon careful consideration, and we go to the website and we review the rules. The problem is we're making these decisions based upon what our peers are doing. And when we see our peers engaging in one way or another, we think, well, you know, Bob's doing it. He's one of the best attorneys I know. It must be okay. So we're going to take a look at some of those moments. Um, this is one of my favorite tragic stories, somewhat tragic stories, but this is something that we see all the time. Uh, Betty Samus is an attorney in Illinois, and she is an employment lawyer. And her client comes to her and says, you know, I, I was let go. I want you to take a look at my case. I want to hire you. I want to collect unemployment. And they discuss the facts of the case, and she says, look, you know, based upon what you're telling me, I can tell you right now that you cannot collect based upon how, how everything went down. And he says, he responds, well, he's like, I know. I mean, I've talked to a bunch of lawyers. I've heard it all before. I understand what you're saying. I still want you to take my money. Please take my money. Please do anything you can to do it, to, to, to help me, to see if there's any possible room. And this is probably Betty's first mistake in the case. 
because she accepts the money. And of course, we all know, never take money from a client if you don't think you can actually help. But she does, and not surprisingly, she gets the file, and lo and behold, there's nothing to be done. He cannot, uh, he cannot collect unemployment. And she delivers the news. And so now client is unemployed, out $1,500, with a lot of time on his hands to go and review the attorney who now is the focal point of all of his anger and frustration. And so he posts this review. Same as accepted a $1,500 fee, even though she knew full well that a law in Illinois would prevent me from obtaining unemployment benefits. Now Betty reaches out to client, because she's like, this is just not fair. We talked about this when you came in, I told you that you couldn't recover, how, how, you know, how could you post this review? Mm -hmm. And the client says, well, you know, I, I, I hear you. I understand where you're coming from. And he says, I'll, I'll go ahead and take down that review if, anybody want to guess what, the, what he wanted? His money, back. His money back. This is Betty's second mistake in the case. She says, this is so hard for attorneys. I don't know why, especially in this day and age of online reviews. Attorneys love to say, well, I did the work. They paid for my time, and I spent the time, even though I told him that what the result was going to be. She does not give the money back. Uh, she goes to Avo, and she says, Avo, you know, this is, this is a problem. Avo, of course, as you know, will take down the review, and they'll do, a little, they'll do an investigation just to determine whether or not that attorney-client relationship exists. All Avo wants to know is, you know, hey, client, you wrote this review. Can you prove that this person was your attorney? Um, and if you send a retainer agreement or any kind, of, um, any kind of document to suggest that the relationship was there, the review goes back up. So that happens. So Betty is now out of options. She had the review come down. Now it's back up. What does she do? She takes to the Internet herself. Do not do this. <laughs> not the way to solve this problem. She says, I dislike it very much when my clients lose, but I cannot invent positive facts for clients when they are not there. I feel badly for him, but his own actions in beating up a female co-worker are what caused the consequences he is now so upset about. He do not do this. <laughs> Do not do this. Um, ultimately, this ends in um, a public reprimand after more than a year, actually, of litigation. So now Betty has to hire her own attorneys. Her attorneys argue the public feels entitled to slander a lawyer, and they don't realize they've blown their privilege when they do so. And of course, this should, for the lawyers in the room, sound somewhat familiar. Right? We know that privilege exists, but then if they sue you, there's some rule where now you get to talk about their case. Right? This sounds familiar. As it turns out, the rule is you need to be in a formal tribunal. So if that client had brought her to a formal tribunal, then she could talk about what was happening with the case. As it turns out, the internet is not a formal tribunal. Quite public, not formal. Very Don't public. do what she did. Okay, so what do you do? What is the best way to deal with these moments, right? Because eventually, it's likely that anybody who's practicing law is going to get one of these reviews. And anybody on the business side of things will say, you know, like, so you look at this as a better option. So the reality is we live in a world where you're going to have reviews online. Matter of fact, you actually want reviews online, right? But bad reviews happen. So here's a better option where you can think about how to respond to it without breaking privilege, without breaking confidentiality, showing that you're a trustworthy attorney, that you know what, you can learn from what they've said to you, right? and take it as great feedback. So we can read here what Nathan did as an example. And this is how you want to think about responding to something and dealing with those friction points that happen as a modern practice, dealing with and wanting online reviews. And sometimes they're not always the ones that you would really like and love. And in fact, if you talk to a business coach, a business coach will say, you absolutely have to respond. You cannot leave a negative review just hanging out there. It's funny, we were just at the Georgia Solo Conference last week and I was talking to somebody, he's like, well, I'm in charge of writing all of the rules in Georgia and you should never respond. And I was like, well, actually, you, you have to respond if you're running a business. You can't just have this out there and go unremarked. So this is a great way. I'm sorry you had this experience at the Smith Law Firm. We spend so much time helping so many injured workers get the workers' compensation benefits they need. Perhaps we can sometimes be slower at returning individual phone calls than we would like. It's our mission to stand up for the average working guy against big insurance companies, so that does take a lot of time. We will recommit to helping as many injured workers as we can, so thank you for bringing this to my attention. Who is this author speaking, who is this lawyer speaking to? 
Right? That's like, a guess. Who do you think? Like Betty was definitely talking to her client, right? Like but future clients. Future, future clients. clients. Yes. Client's never going to come back and hire you and pay you money. You're talking to future clients. This kind of response is absolutely something that I would hire this guy. I would say, hey, that could happen. This person's reasonable. And the thing to think about, too, as for your past clients, you know, if they are upset because when people and things don't go their way, they're going to be pissed off. But if you respond appropriately, if you put back in your mission, right, what your values set are and really not responding to their anger, you'll get a lot, you know, you, you get a lot more with honey than you do with, you know, anything else, so. Um, okay, so there's a lot of ways that attorneys run into this. I like this one as well. Perkins Cooey, if you guys are familiar, it's a really big law firm. They represent all kinds of big name clients. Mm -hmm. um, so for a while, they're having their attorneys, they have a bunch of attorneys, they're all writing their own bios. This was the part of the bio of this particular attorney. Represented cloud computing provider and Federal Trade Commission investigation under Section 5 of the FTC Act regarding security practices for mobile access to cloud computing science. Service. Does that mean anything to y'all? It means nothing to me, nor should it. It means a little something to me, but not that much. <clears throat> um, I'm, not a, like, legal, I'm not a tech reporter, though, right. with 50,000 followers. Um, so Christopher Sogoin tweets after reading that, tech reporters might want to call Dropbox and ask them if they've been investigated by the FTC. Right? There are a lot of, affirm I'm a criminal defense attorney, my clients, I don't talk about who my clients are. There are plenty of law firms where who they represent is public. You've got to be really careful about this. As it turns out, uh, the company that was being investigated in this case was not Dropbox. It was their other client, Box. Neither client was particularly happy about this attention on Twitter uh, and caused them a lot of trouble. Okay. So when you're thinking about, you know, the friction that exists and you're trying to build out a modern practice and, and wanting to innovate and be creative, what's one of the things we're all thinking to do, right? We're all saying it's time to get, way of the, get rid of the billable hour. So like the billable hour, clients hate it, attorneys hate it, it takes up a lot of time to manage it, but what are the friction points that exist with getting rid of the billable hour? So you decide, I want to transition to flat fees, right? That's what I do, I do flat fees, it's great, but when you're doing flat fees, you have to consider where does, where does the money go? Does it go in a trust account, right? Can I just deposit into my operating account? You know, is it okay? Do I put, what do I put in my retainer agreement? Fast forward to just recently, if you're a California attorney, they just made some additional rules that make having flat fees even more friction for you as you're trying to build out a modern practice. So you're thinking to yourself, all right, I want to do this, I want to ditch it, but now what? So for California attorneys, right now you have to consider not only notifying your clients and giving them the option of where to put the money, but it needs to go in your retainer. You need to open up a trust account in case the, in case the client says, you know what, you can't put it in the operating, you must put it in a trust account. And so it's like, you know, you want to be modern, you want to think what's happening, but the friction exists and you have to think about, okay, how do I innovate around it? How do I manage these things when it comes to trying to move away from practices that we all don't like, that our clients don't like, that don't serve us well, but the rules are there that maybe cause a bit of a friction on trying to get it done. Okay, so the other business advice we're getting, right, is we need to talk about, we need to be on social, we need to talk about the value we're providing to our clients. But lawyers are special, right? We're not like all other businesses. It's not as easy as for us to talk about it. Um, and this is a great example of, this is actually a local attorney, I've, I've covered his name um, and face, but this is somebody from my area. Mm -hmm. This is if you are a practicing attorney and especially in small or solo law firms, your social feeds probably have a lot of, a lot of this, um, especially if you're a criminal defense attorney, but even if not. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is a local attorney, he's in the parking lot of the courthouse. That's where this picture is taken and posted. Beat a weed case for Carlos this morning just by showing up prepared for trial. Evidence was against us was weak, and we had a lot of reasonable doubt to work with, so the DA offered us a great probation. Okay, this is an amazing piece of advertising, right? Like, you are absolutely showing your value in the cert that you can provide to future clients. It's a problem here, though. Why is he brushing up against legal ethics? He's showing a picture of his client, right? Like he's showing One. a picture of his client. Right. He's naming him, even if it's just the first name. Right. He's telling the world he was charged with, a, in Georgia, DA means you were charged with a felony possession of marijuana. Right. Um, now, can you talk about this kind of stuff online? Can you get your client's permission? You certainly can. What do we need from our clients? 
Informed consent, y'all. Informed consent, right? We've all heard of it. If you actually look up the definition of informed consent in your rules, you will be astonished. You need to, often you need to suggest that they consult with another attorney about this issue before making a decision. Problem here is, the conversation probably went something like this. Yo, Carlos, yeah. High five, man. I'm psyched too. You're no longer facing years in prison. By the way, do you mind if we snap a quick fit pic so I can post it on Instagram? Right? What isn't happening in those conversations is the likelihood, the reasonable risk of what could be the outcome of you saying yes to this. Like, maybe someday some attorney will be standing up on stage and your picture will be on a slide and telling the world that or you're Or alternatively, maybe an employer, maybe you're not supposed to, but maybe an employer is going to go search. And guess what? In this day and age of social media that once you put it up there, it doesn't go away. They see this post, you know you didn't get arrested, but wait, you were in trouble for something related to a felony charge? Wow, you know? So as, a, as attorneys, we have, to, we have to think, we want to use social media, right? We want to do these different things, but we want to also be responsive to what the future could look like for our clients, what the issues that we bump up against when we're using these tools that we should be using, you should be using, but how do you creatively use it? Yes. You need to figure out a, a way to show your value. So the question is, does it change if it's a civil case? The rules do not make a distinction right. about that. Um, and so what I see often on the civil cases is, is uh, civil guys are much more free about it, right? Because mm -hmm. they're not thinking. And I think in civil cases, you may be even more exposed because the civil communities, you guys, you guys list like names and money awards and facts of cases. And I'm looking at this like, are, do you, did you really have a very lengthy conversation with your client about this post on your website? It's a huge problem. There's no, there's no caveat here. Just for criminal law, we're much like, it's much more sensitive because obviously, you know, you, the issue. It, it's, right. it's hard to imagine anybody would be okay with the, telling the world that you're charged with a felony. And I will also marijuana. push back. One of the things you see, you hear a lot of, so, you know, I'm in a, I do a transactional practice, and you hear a lot of people only talk about the litigation space, right? But the same exists in transactional space, too, right? Like, you could be telling a lot about your clients, like we, we saw, you know, with the, if you're working with big corporate clients and you're just spelling out what you're doing for them, there might be things that they don't want people to know about, right? Moves that they're trying to make. So even if we're not even just thinking about in the litigation space, also in the transactional space, be aware, be be clear on what you're doing, not to say you can't, but if you're gonna do it, take the right steps to protect yourself. Um, so here's another good example. Now he's not blowing client confidences, but this is another day of winning in Fulton County. Two DUIs dismissed today. Those are very high blood alcohol numbers. For those of you who are not DUI defense attorneys, we have a bunch of local Fulton County practitioners here. Manel, you wanna tell me, how, if you're not Ben Sessions, how you get two DUIs dismissed in one day? <laughs> no, that's Ben Sessions. <laughs> Other way you get this, the way this particular attorney's getting it, officer does not show. Right. That's how you win these cases. So and if, you were, if you were a potential Facebook. client, right, and you saw this, would you be like, oh my God, I want to I hire this attorney. You got, you got him off, right? This is amazing. It's great advertising. You are definitely showing your value, right? You're telling the world, I'm valuable. Uh, the problem, and you're not blowing confidences, right? He hasn't named a client. He hasn't told anything other than the blood alcohol level. Here's the problem. We, this is definitely advertising. So there's, no, there's nothing like, oh, this is my private Facebook page, so it's not advertising, so I don't have to worry about the rules. Not true. There's no state that I'm aware of that says, oh, if it's your private Facebook page, you're okay. You're putting this on here for advertising. Um, the problem is you're not allowed to make truthful statements that also omit material facts that could be misleading, right? So anybody looking at this, well, I have a Fulton County DUI, and it's a .23, maybe I need to call this attorney you're going to be making assumptions based upon the lack of information, right? And you know that you're getting that, right? Like whenever you're trying to make it sound a little bit better than it is, that's where you've crossed the line. Because had he been honest and said, another day of winning in Fulton County when the officers did not show, right? <laughs> It's not as effective. It's not as good at showing your value. So you need to watch out for this. This is happening all the time. This is just constant steady stream of this right now on social. And everybody's doing it, right? So it must be okay. It in fact is not. Now what we don't see a lot of is the bars reaching out. This is very hard to keep up with regulation. So we don't see a lot of people getting targeted necessarily for this behavior, although when they do, Megan will tell you, it's usually the competitors, your competitors who are gonna turn you in. Mm -hmm. um, but what usually happens in these cases is you get a complaint about something else. 
Something else comes up, client wants a file back, you didn't give the file back, client's mad about something, and then they start doing the investigation and they start looking at your presence online, and all of a sudden now you have new problems with the disciplinary board because they've discovered that you're violating these other rules. So it's not necessary, you can't just say, oh, well, nobody's gonna turn me in, I'm gonna be fine. If it's out there, you're at risk, um, even though everybody's doing it. And so there are better ways to kind of respond to it, right? Like there are things that we can do. Again, you have to be on social. You have to, you have to market yourself. If you're going to be a modern attorney, you're going to drive a modern law business, you need to be out there, right? Period, end of story. But how do you do it better? You do it like this, right? So here's an attorney that did get a good win for her client, but doesn't have to put all of her client's information out, and it still has the same feel and effect, right? It's still saying, I won, right? No, way to, no better way to celebrate. Hey, they're clipping off that ankle bracelet. Amazing. So if you're a future client, you're happy. If you're a past client, sure, but you don't even have to show who I am, and I'm not really bad about it. So if something comes, you've kept the trust with your past client, you're building trust with your future clients, and you're responding to the rules and being very intentional about how you're putting your information up on social. Right. So like, if there's a quick tip out there when you're using and engaging in social, is to plan ahead. You don't need, first of all, don't ever do this in real time tip, right? Second of all, plan ahead, right? Like, you can, you can do these things and then be intentional about how you're utilizing these tools to help market yourself, to help brand yourself without violating the rules. Yeah, um, but, but be aware of them. I didn't hide her name because I think she's, she's being very careful. When I saw this, I was like, this is somebody who's paying attention to the rules. Right. I knew immediately, and it's very clever and good. And it's smart. Uh -huh. But like, what's the, what, what happens now, right? Like, we love technology. If, you know, you know, I can talk about technology all day, every day. I can tell you about a tool, which one to use, which one you love, right? Amazing. So tech is a part, about, a part of building a modern law practice, period. But there are tools that we have to really think about, and how do we actually use them? In reality, in our practices. So for... Are you using I, contact forums? Right, on your we, we both use those, right? Tell us about your case. Tell us about you. Someone from our office will be in touch with you. Exactly. Um, or like messaging tools or virtual receptionists. So, all these tools that are using, you're using in your practice, how do you implement them while still responding to and understanding what the ethical issues are that, are, that, are, that are present themselves? So, Aaron and I both use Typeform. Anybody out here use Typeform? Uh, in it's their a practice? form tool. Do you do intake forms, Google Forms, WooFoo, any of the forms for automating your process, Lori? I think. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, so yeah, Typeform, we use it. It's a great tool. It moves, it moves people through the process really well. But what happened with Typeform a couple months ago? They had a breach, right? And what does Typeform do? Typeform actually holds the data. So I also use uh, Zapier, and we're not going to talk about Zapier here today, but you'll definitely probably hear about it in the conference. That's a tool that doesn't hold on to the data. They don't store it. They just move data from one place to another, and then their hands are clean. Typeform and all the form tools they store that data. They just keep it there. It's waiting for you in perpetuity, right? So, so that's a huge problem. So one of the practice tips, you need to be aware of who's holding the data and what I do, because I use Typeform. I'll go through and I'll delete that data every week. Like I have new clients coming on, they're giving me the information and I'll delete it. So I'll like when sure you think about Typeform and something like that and how Aaron and I use it to delete the data out, it's still understanding the ethic issue, ethical issues, right? We know we want to have a modern practice that engages people quickly, gets them through our process fast, and so how do we use a tool that might still store this data and not ha impacted by a breach like that? You go in and you delete things, right? You're purposeful and you're intentional. You understand what the rules say and you kind of work through it. But these are friction points, right? Because tech is always going to be a friction point for us. And right? are you getting advice from like your SEO consultant? This was a thing my SEO consultant's like, of course I'm looking at your contact forms, your intake, the contact forms from your website. How will I know your ROI? Like how will I know if this is working, if I'm not seeing who's signing up and who's reaching out to you? And I was like, you are absolutely not entitled to that. Uh, the rules prohibit prohibit you, even if they're not your client yet, they're your potential client, you are not allowed to share that information with anyone, including your SEO consultant or whoever it is that you're using, and they love that data. Um, and actually, the person that I use, he's like, Aaron, you know, I hear you talking about this other attorneys, but I got to tell you, none of my other clients bring this up. Like, well, <laughs> I talk to other attorneys and they tell me, Aaron, my SEO guy did not bring this up at all. Yeah. So it's our duty. We need to pay attention just because someone's asking for that information, just because all the other people are doing it, we are not allowed to share that. Um, same thing with virtual receptionists. I think it's so great to be using them, but how are they using the information? How are they storing the information that they get? What are they doing with it? Do you have an agreement with them that they're going to be acting as if they were a secretary in your office and keeping it confidential? You want to be mindful. Yes, embrace technology but also 
we need to be aware that we're responsible for this data once we keep it, collect it, and send it out into the world. So like you're using all this technology and you're trying to figure out what next, like what, do I, what am I supposed to do? Engage it, use it, understand it, but one of the things you don't want to do is you don't want to use Gmail, right? Well, and so when I say Gmail, and I know, when I say Gmail, I'm not talking about your firm's name, at yourfirmname.com, I'm talking at gmail.com. Matter of fact, I'm gonna take it a step further. If you're using at AOL, at Hotmail, at Yahoo, any like, free, any free Service. tool, there is a cost to using a free tool, right? Because you are exchanging something to get for using that free tool. So Gmail is a great example because as lawyers, we're ready to get up and do our business, but we have to think about what are the friction points. The friction points are using free tools that are really not meant for the purpose that we're using so to maintain confidentiality, to have those higher levels of protection that we need to understand and utilize better. And if you're not sure if you're using the free tool, here's a hint, like, does it, is it, Aaron Gerson saying at gmail.com, because if it's at gmail.com, then it's free. Right. Um, and what, what are they doing? They're using, they're going through that, they're going through your emails to figure out what ads are gonna work for you. Mm -hmm. And it used to be just algorithms, right? It used to just be machines, robots reading in and trying to match you with the right uh, advertiser. Just last month, they released information. Gmail's like, actually, no, there are people. This is available for people to read. Now, I don't know that there are people, live humans, reading every single email that you ever have. But. It was terrifying, though, because I do have a private free email account <laughs> that goes back to, like, 2004, which is basically my whole life is in there and available to Google to do with what they please. Right. Um, That's but, the cost of using a free tool, right? But, and oh. since they came out last month saying that people are reading it, absolutely, I can't think of a state in the country that would say this is okay for client communication because it absolutely is not. And clients love to use it. Cli your clients are going to be using the Gmail accounts. You need to tell your clients, hey, we can, this, is, this is available. This information is not going to be necessarily private. So how do you transition your clients then, right? What, what are the, what's the ways to say, hey, client, these tools aren't as secure. We're having secure conversations that I don't want to have open to anyone, right? It's using secure opportunities. So, you know, Aaron and I haven't been able to test these, but in a, most, in a very well, recent first, above first the client law. portals. First, right. the best thing is Clio has a great client portal. I don't communicate all the time with my clients through exactly. the portal because they would hate me and probably go find and a I'll different say, attorney. And I'll say, I do. And I do. So that's, that's a different practice point, but that's how you really work with your clients. But these particular tools, you know, we, we can talk about client portals in a second, but these particular tools are options for you as an alternative, right? To think about how do I securely communicate with my clients? But when you're, when you're thinking about going that next step further and using a portal, what's the advantage and how do you sell it? Because what do, what do attorneys say? Well, my, my, attorney, my clients are going to use it. Well, you explain to them that it's secure. You explain to them that it doesn't have to be every single communication. You explain to them that, you know what, this allows us to have those one-offs that maybe you don't want other people to see really quickly that we can keep between us. So there's really ways to show the value of it for your clients and allow you to maintain the maintain ethical rules and obligations that we need to uphold ourselves by as attorneys. Um, so one of the problems, this also came up last week at the Georgia Bar Solo um, event, and they're going through all these tips, and they're like, okay, lawyers, you all have to read the terms of service. Of so every, let me ask y'all, like, how many people have read any terms of service of any tech tool that they're using today? Oh, okay. Like, and I appreciate and how long the honesty of the rest of you. Right, and how, and how, how long did it take you? Eight. It depends. Minutes. It depends, right? But someone said ages. The reality is it might be ages. And, and the question is, are you always reading it every time they send you an update? Are you keeping up to date? Do you see the changes, right? And the answer is no. Right. right. Like the reality is, yes, every single bar regulator will tell you you have to do it. Every article you read is you have to do it. I really like this art installation um, because it's basically just the terms of service printed out and, and he's put it up. Uh, the longest one there is Instagram. It's a 60 minute read. So this is not, so when we were standing there, actually someone in this room, we were with our friend and she was like, I sure hope they don't expect the lawyers to be getting any work done if they're reading all the terms of service. Right. And if you're gonna be tech driven, you're going to have a lot of terms of service to review. Period, end of story, right? So here, it's a friction point. The reality is we know not everyone in this room raised their hand. If I'm sitting here being honest, I cannot read them all, all the time. But what do I do? There's certain provisions I'm looking for, right? There's certain things I can and ask And if about. you're not reading them, we need to be aware of like, how are we vulnerable here? Exactly. This service that we're using, how are we using our clients' information? Where could these vulnerabilities be? Where we're exposing our clients for our practices? Okay, um, so those are the friction points where lawyers are doing a lot of the wrong thing. I also wanna talk about this workaround. Um, and I've dubbed it the Shabbat approach. Hmm. 
One of my favorite things about being Jewish in Judaism is that we're very legalistic. There's a spiritual component, but frankly, the primary focus is, are you following the rules? That is the focus. And so for those people who celebrate or who observe Shabbat, what that means on the weekend is you're not supposed to be working, you're supposed to be reflecting with your family. Work traditionally was defined as lighting a fire and putting out a fire. And that's been interpreted, that rule, that law, has been interpreted in modern day to the use of uh, electricity. So you're not allowed to flip on a light or turn off a light because somehow that's work based upon an old definition. But we're very legalistic, right? So we have workarounds to those rules. What is one of my favorite Shabbat workarounds? I lived in Jerusalem for a while. Um, in Jerusalem, most, most businesses are Shabbat friendly. Uh, you, wanna, you live in a high tower in Jerusalem. You need to get on the elevator. That's right, elevator yeah. stops on every floor. Mm -hmm. Nobody's pushing the button to engage in work, to, start, to cause that electricity, to cause that light to go on, and to cause that thing to move. You can use timers. You can set all of your devices on timers. As long as you're doing it before Shabbat starts, you are good to go, right? <laughs> Isn't being well, an elevator considered work? No, it's well, not, right? And so these are legal workarounds. Now, are they following the letter of the rule? Absolutely. Are they, following the, are they following the spirit of the rule? No. No, they're not. If you can have your TV go on to watch the game because you set a timer, right? Like this is basically just a normal day. Right. But we as Jews were very legalistic, so it's okay. Uh, so similarly, that is not showing up. Uh, similarly, Whoa. in the tech space, we have a lot of innovative companies and lawyers who are um, following the letter of the, the rule, even if not the spirit, and if that, you know, in Judaism, those are God's rules. We're pretty much stuck with them, right? But in the regulatory space, we're lawyers. We self-regulate. We can actually make better rules. So here are some examples of what that This is like. one, it should say law clerk, but it's law clerk. So law clerks here, go check them out, right? A great tech tool that's really trying to respond to the needs, particularly around solo and smalls, right? So you're working, you're doing your work, you have all these clients coming in, you're getting frenzied, a lot of things to do, and what happens? You might start turning around, turning away work. But why do you want to do that? You're trying to build a practice that you're trying to grow and, and gain as much you know, revenue as possible so that you can do other things in your life. So what does Law Kirk do? They come in and they enter and they say, we can provide you additional support to help you grow your practice. So instead of you needing to turn away a potential client, you can use our service. But how do they actually define the service? How are they taking the Shabbat approach working around it, right? Like to still stay kind of within the, within the rules, but not really focusing on the spirit of it. You're they gonna are saying, hire, yeah, you're gonna hire an attorney. Right. We're gonna call them a paraprofessional. Exactly, so They're a gonna paraprofessional. Draft documents. Go ahead, sorry. <laughs> They're gonna draft documents, but it's gonna be under the supervision. So they're in all, in what is this, what's the rule that we're, we're worried about here is the unauthorized practice of law, right? If you're gonna tap into a national network of lawyers to do work in one particular state, and they're not barred in that state, that could be a problem unless we call them a paraprofessional, and unless they're not gonna directly necessarily engage with the client, right? So this is a great Shabbat workaround. Here, I think I had a question over here. Okay. And I'll say, you know, here's the reality of this. This is how a lot of firms practice, right? Solo and smalls have a hard time thinking of ourselves practicing this way. But, you know, it's being very intentional. So they, they develop a technology tool that's saying, hey, the rules say attorneys can't do unauthorized practice of law across different states. So instead, they brought you in as a paraprofessional, the attorney, your practice, you still represent the clients, you still have all the advice, but you have the support to help you grow strategically and intentionally, right? And then you have another tool like Thurvo, another... A uh, company like Thurvo that I, sends... Do you guys get these emails? I get these emails from Thurvo. I've never signed up for Thurvo. I get these emails like every week, multiple emails. They're like, hey, there's a new client. They might need your help. Would you like to bid on it? And how do they work around it? Thurvo is actually not just legal. It's for any kind of service. Uh, the rule that we're worried about in this particular example is... Anybody know? Fee sharing. Fee sharing. Exactly. Right, because we can't, as lawyers, pay referral fees. We can't, we can't share our fees for somebody bringing us the client. So what does Thurvo have? And I don't actually think that... I don't know why this PDF is showing. I don't think that they've actually, um, I don't think that uh, Thurvo has actually been looked at by the regulators. They're also sort of flying under the radar because they're not, you know, straight ahead just for lawyers. Um, but they say, oh, okay, well, you're going to pay us. You're going to buy Thurvo credits from us and spend those Thurvo credits to bid on this work, right? So they're somehow doing this work around potentially more successfully than Avo was able to do it when they discontinued their service, but Avo had a service similarly where they were basically doing the same thing, but they were just taking a percentage of the fee that you 
you uh, quoted to the client, and that was shut down as being fee splitting, right? So Thurvo has got this Shabbat workaround, but how different is that than what Av, the service Ava was providing? The spirit of the rule is in question there. So then you have a, this is another um, company, tech company enabled by a law firm called Atrium. So you can go check them out, their existence, they're working right now. But what are they doing? So it's the same idea. So they are trying to raise money to be more modern and to drive better and value, more valuable services for their clients. They're technologists, right? not lawyers. They're like, we have this great technology where we're going to read documents really fast. We're going to have robots that read documents really fast. and Get up that process. A lot of the work that lawyers do. But like, how would you get technologists to invest in building this tool if they can't share in the profits? So Atrium did this great thing where they have two companies. Right. So Atrium has a tech tool that speeds up the process, that gets, gets you through, that for a transactional space, you know, drafting contracts takes a long time, closing deals takes a long time. Clients hate that, and they feel like if we're billing by the hour, it's going to really raise fees. So they really automated and streamlined it through, through a piece of technology. And, and then so they, they license did, that. Right. Have to companies. Atrium, the law firm. Right. right, Atrium, the tech company, is owned by a bunch of technologists. They license the software to the law firms. The law firm, there's a law firm layer where you do at the end have a lawyer looking at it. But all of those law firm profits get funneled in through the go back to the technology company right. through their licensing agreement. Right, so this is a great Shabbat workaround where you actually have innovation. You can raise money. Um, they have a ton of money right now pouring into them, and you have outside investors. But this is really a workaround. How different is this than what we're, you know, so worried is going to corrupt the legal system by, you know, allowing non-lawyer ownership? This is a great example, but it's also very limiting because for small and solo law firms, we don't always have quite that flexibility that they do. Um, okay, so for our last Shabbat workaround, because we're going to run out of time, <laughs> a military spouse waiver. This is like a really cool thing that's being promoted, and I so agree with Linda Klein. Uh, this is where if you're married to somebody who's in the military and you're a lawyer and you have to move from state to state to state and now you have to take a bunch of bars and you're basically now can't practice as a lawyer because right. if you're also trying to raise a family, it's like game over. Um, so now there's this waiver where bars can admit people who are the spouse of people in the military, which I love. I think that's so great. They send in an application and they say, hey, please, Georgia, please accept me. Um, and Georgia looks at it and determines if you're fit. But what it's does this bring role. up? And it works really well for a military spouse, right? We're okay with doing it in this particular area. But then, if we're okay with it because we realize it doesn't impact the, our client, our consumer, which is the goals of the ethics rules, right? If where's it where's the, the line? Public. Like, where do if, we go from there? Right, if it doesn't hurt the public to have military spouses do it, it shouldn't hurt the public to have anybody else do it. Exactly. So this is another example of where we really need to be pushing back on this regulation. These restrictions don't make sense in the modern world. There's plenty other compelling stories about people who have to move state to state. It shouldn't just, if it doesn't hurt the public for military spouses, it shouldn't hurt the public for anyone else. So let's talk about this, right? Uber. Everybody knows Uber. Uber, Lyft, all these great, tool, you know, great services that came in that, that said, we're going to innovate before you're even ready for it, before it's even thought of as a, something for you to do. So Uber saw an issue, taxis, hard to get, how do we get on-demand ridership? Let's, let's develop that out. The more, the legal yeah, the space, more modern version is like the bird. We got the bird. Do you guys have bird scooters in, in your city? We got the bird. They bring in these scooters. They just drop them off in your city. And they're yeah. like, city council, catch up. Like, yeah. We have no rules about where the birds are supposed to be. How do you use them? And they're just scooters for everybody. So that's the Uberization effect. Yes. Um, so let's talk about where, where we started, right? So running a virtual law practice. Have, has anybody here a virtual attorney? Okay. So, okay, great. So I do know a couple that are in here, right? So I started my practice as a virtual attorney, right? When, when I started, it was still at the forefront. It was not something very accepted. And quite honestly, I wanted to really stay underneath the radar because I knew I was doing it differently. I knew clients liked it. I knew I didn't want to have all that huge brick and mortar cost to really drive up my fees for my clients. But guess what? The bars weren't there. People were not ready. They, the, the rules really didn't respond to it. Matter of fact, the rules said we had to have a bona fide office in a lot of states. Asterisk, some states still have these rules. Sorry for you. This is actually the first time she's admitting that's in public <laughs> on stage, and she did this. Because you know, she uh, lived like, concerned, like, oh my gosh, this is, am I right. pushing the envelope? Is this okay? But this is also the modern world where obviously this should be okay. Right, and so we're thinking about, okay, virtual practices. It was something that people really weren't accepting before. Fast forward now, I, I did that years ago, right? Years, years, years ago. 
Regulation has caught up. Right. For the most part, we have the bars like, hey, there's power in numbers. You cannot, it's better for clients, it's better for attorneys. We don't need big, huge desks and a secretary, and we don't need that traditional notion of practicing law. That's not the value we deliver to clients. Right. That's not how we help the public. So the rules have, for the most part, caught up. But the, so that's the historical example of what it looks like in the past. We have all of these new companies and services that are pushing the envelope today, doing really cool stuff that regulation still has yet to catch up with. So we'll talk about like subscription services. So we talked about you know figuring out, ditching the bill of hour, getting away from these type of things. And so you have you have attorneys that are saying, you know what, the rules maybe don't talk about how subscriptions works and work in legal, but we're going to still do it. Why? Because clients want it. Attorneys like it, and it allows you to provide value without doing the inconsistent income that we typically have in law firms, right? I mean, the rules are still pushing back on flat fees. I mean, they allow them, but there's still a lot of pushback, never mind subscriptions. Like, subscription appears nowhere in most of your state's rules. And then you have things like unbundled, right? So let's, like, unbundled services are other options for people to think about as alternative ways. So unbundled, for those of you who don't know, is like, hey, maybe my client just needs like a little bit of help from a lawyer, right? We most, a lot of us probably spend time on the phone giving that little bit of help for free. Like, oh, you really don't need a lawyer, but here's what you do need to know. Um, so Hello Divorce is one of my favorite companies, Erin Levine out of California. She does, has a fantastic product. She would be here today, except she's doing something really cool at Duke right now. Gotcha, um, yes. So. Uh, but she breaks it up. Hey, maybe you want to do it yourself, a uh, divorce. Maybe you want like just a help, a little bit of help in this direction. Maybe you just want resources of what you need to know to gather it all. Maybe eventually you go through this and you say, actually, no. You know, we thought it was going to be uncontested. It's not, and you need to get a lawyer. But these are. This is how consumers want to shop. Consumers know that they can figure it out online. Consumers know that LegalZoom is often as good as hiring a lawyer. They are looking for this. It's not only competitive, but it's better for your practice. Um, it allows you to provide more value to more people. Um, I get to brag for a minute <laughs> on my sister. Another example of sort of unbundling and coaching, my sister Jenny Gerson saying who's here, uh, practices in San Diego, and she was a former public defender and now has a private practice. Well, as it turns out in California, the people are arrested even on misdemeanor, small, minor stuff. You can get the public defender, but you don't get to talk to them until your first court date. That may not sound like a big deal, except Private people who get out of jail and can afford to hire private attorneys, they meet with that attorney the next day. And then, and that first court date doesn't come for months sometimes. Private attorney, you walk into court on that first day, if you've gone to the right class, you've done the community service, you may get your case dismissed on that day. So people with money have the luxury of only having to go to court once, they get their case dismissed, they're ready well in advance. The public defenders, because of how the rule works, public defenders are literally not allowed to talk to these people until their first court date. So, so then you have like opportunities like what Jenny's doing, right? Where you're coming in and you're saying, you know, what clients need things, right? That maybe are not always legal services, or they need some assistance to get them through the process to move through the system They just faster. need a 60 minute phone call with a right. lawyer to tell them, how can I get ready? So when I walk in on that first day and meet with my PD, I have the same thing that the private clients have. I just want a 30 minute, 60 minute phone call with somebody to get me prepared. Yep. So legal coaching is one of those examples of unbundling where you're providing real value in a place that the system really just can't because of the way the rules are written. So we have a lot of examples, but I'm going to speed through them a little bit so you guys can kind of see what it looks like when people are saying, we're going to push through, right? We're going to be the Uber of our industry because you know what? We want to do things different. We want to modernize. We want to serve more people in different ways. Enter a divorce attorney. This is a divorce attorney who said, you know what? I'm in my, I'm in my family law practice doing all these great things. I meet all these great people. But what am I realizing? That I'm actually learning a lot about the process, a lot about what's working for them and what's not working for them. And so how do I serve my clients better? What makes a good relationship better? and what doesn't right. make a good relationship? So how do I come in and I say, I want to serve my clients a little bit differently? Or maybe not even people who are my clients, serve another part of what they are. Think about people holistically. Enter dating coaching, dating coaching right? You're an attorney that has a lot of knowledge and you provide a different service that is still like adjacent to what you're doing and it's pushing it forward. The question is, is it legal services? Eh, maybe not, right? But is it utilizing your legal knowledge to provide a service that your clients need, right? So the law, if we want to stay in the traditional way of thinking of the law, it's going to be really hard to push forward. But if we want to take a holistic approach, what's happening for our clients? How do we respond to them? We can provide a lot of services across that range and provide a lot of value that's not always just I'm going to help you get that divorce, right? It's going to say, how do I help you move on with life after, right? And I know, and I, you know, it's, it's new, it's different, but it's part of what, it, what can what happen. What is the core of what we do as lawyers? 
we help people solve problems that they cannot solve on their own. Like that fundamentally is why they come and hire us and talk to us, right? So figuring out a way, we are expanding the definition of where we provide that value far faster than regulation can keep up with. Right. Um, so then you okay, have so things like this. I'm going to speed through a couple of these. So we just have, yeah, so we'll have, we have attorneys that are helping other attorneys figure out how to develop new products. We have attorneys that are providing services to clients that are saying, hey, you want to do it yourself? I'm going to show you how to do it yourself, and you don't have to engage me, right? So enter Megan, right? If you want to learn how to build a product, Here. go watch their talk tomorrow about building a product as an attorney. But this is an ethics attorney, an ethics attorney that sells a product, right? Pushing the envelope forward, saying, you don't always need to engage me, right? It's understanding where our clients are, where they are on that spectrum. Not everything that clients need is going to be our service, right? And I lawyers think always think we can do it ourselves, right? right? Like, I, I, even I have, like, pain right. about the idea of... But not even just lawyers, lawyer. people, people. All clients, that's how the legal zooms came into play, right? People feel they can do some of the things on their own, and the reality is, y'all, they can, right? We hate to say it, but sometimes actually you can. So why not provide them what they need, right? Why stop, why stop your revenue generation from happening because you simply say, no, I have to be the one to do it. No, instead, provide them these services. So then you have people like Contract Shop that's doing it and that's really thinking about how to hone in in her industry and be very industry specific. So when they think about her, they're thinking about, you know, Contract shop, she sells, it's sort of like LegalZoom, but she sells it to creatives. So she's like, hey, do you need a contract that addresses, um, you're a wedding photographer, you need right. a contract that speaks just to that. And she's actually, just as a business, Christina Scalera is really smart. She goes where she's rare. Like, we all here at this conference, we're in a room of lawyers. The conferences that she goes to, she's the only lawyer in the room. And then, and they love her and they line up, but she's figured out a way to unlock this value to people. She spends her time where she's rare and she provides this value specifically to those clients. It's a, it's a brilliant business plan. And, and so then we have well. like another forward thinking, pushing the envelope firm pr of practice, right? So Brooke, Brooke is in the thing. I'm going to point her here, right? My virtual dot lawyer. So what is my virtual dot lawyer doing? They are licensing. Maybe that is blowing your minds and you're like, oh my gosh, where are we going? But the future of law is pushing beyond what we typically think about how we serve clients, how we engage attorneys to, to build practices that they love, that they want to be a part of, right? That's designed for them and designed for the client. And so what are they doing? They're saying, hey, do you not like running all that operation stuff in your practice? Do you want to be behind a great business, a great, behind a great brand? Do you want to help get that support while you can still do what you do and love serving your clients? Well, come, come with us. You can license it for us, right? Uh, and then finally, let's go to really where we're not in the U.S., What's right? the future look like for legal in right? the U.S.? Let's look outside because as it turns out, the U.S. is really slow right now, which is terrifying because the legal market is not necessarily just a U.S. market. It is a global market, not necessarily and it, for and if you practice, see, for a lot of practice. Right, so this Ernst & Young is a great example to say where, where are things going. So the big four accounting firms, they are consistently buying up all types of legal service providers to provide holistic approach to, to responding to the needs of their clients. So yeah, they're doing a lot of things that you would have thought attorneys used to do. You know, we all know document review sits out there, no one wants to do it, but guess what? Those guys are going to pick it up, they're going to streamline it, and they're going to take that money that you know, big business used to give to a firm, right? Mackenzie can't wait to start taking over big law duties. Like, these companies are coming, and they are coming hard. Exactly. And they're competing far better in global markets, um, and they're going to come after us. Okay, so who else is regulating, right? Like, well, does that mean, like, regulation needs to be scrapped? As it turns out, the modern world has also brought, like, these new regulatory forces. Um, and so, for example, this is very, this is very actually current. Um, Avo had just recently paid $50,000 in fees to the attorney, uh, the New York Attorney General, because apparently this is a space that the Attorney General also is in, and actually New York is very far ahead. They've been cracking down on false reviews as well, and like finding individual businesses $50,000 for posting false um, reviews. But uh, New York Attorney General was interested in Avo because when they looked at how they're representing their product, they found like, well, this isn't exactly fair. So. Here's her comment. When seeking legal advice, consumers most often turn to the internet, and directories like this have an obligation to ensure consumers know what they're getting. My office will continue to protect New York consumers and ensure that they get transparency and accurate information that they deserve. Here's what they did to Avo. They said, not only are you going to pay us money, you're going to remove the rankings from attorneys who do not claim their profile. Right? That's, attorneys have been up in arms about that for the last 
however many years. Uh, disclose limitations of ranking systems, like these are based upon what the attorney provided. Uh, no longer refer to the rating system as unbiased. Mm -hmm. Will have any forms posted to the site reviewed by a qualified lawyer. Here's what's important. The Attorney General is doing what we have normally reserved for our regulatory bod bodies in each and individual state. And this is actually good news. It's good news to see that there are other agencies that are perhaps even better suited to be engaging in this kind of regulation. Um, that's a pretty big fine. AstroTurfing is one of her favorite things to go, one of New York's favorite things to go after as well, which is like, hey, you cannot post false positive reviews on your site. Yelp is getting better at finding, identifying them. Google's great at identifying them. And if you're in New York, you can get fined a huge amount of money. For it. Um, Maybe we want to. We could, we'll speed through a little bit of her of her so, story. Uh, we're gonna quickly go through. But here's the. Um, there, Anya Citron Cern, and she she was an attorney who did something silly when she was a brand new public defender, and she apparently was. Um, she's a great public defender. I've had people come up to me after presentations and be like, <laughs> I know this lawyer. Um, but what she did essentially was it was a murder trial, and her client was in jail, and the family brought in clothing for him to change into, so he's not sitting there in a jumpsuit. And as they're pulling out the clothing to inspect it, they hold up leopard print underwear, and her being the millennial that she is, thought that was pretty funny, so she snapped a quick picture and posted it to her Facebook page, private Facebook page that said proper attire for trial. Within 24 hours, the judge had learned that this had been posted on Facebook. He declares a mistrial. She is unceremoniously fired, and this is what her boss had to say about it. She said, when a lawyer broadcasts disparaging and humiliating words and pictures, it undermines the basic client relationship and gives the appearance that he is not receiving a fair trial. Um, I tend to agree with that, um, but I also agree with some comments on the ABA that said, hey, look, this is, this is how the modern world communicates, right? This is embarrassing. To my knowledge, there was no disciplinary action taken against her, but it probably would have been better for her if that had been the, the, the biggest outcome for her. Luckily, she seems to have landed on her feet, but I will tell you, as of 12 months ago, this is something that happened in 2012, as of 12 months ago, this is what Google was reporting when you searched her name, three of the top entries involved this story, because what happens when an attorney does something embarrassing? So it turns out we're a country that loves to laugh at attorneys messing up. So it hits every single major news outlet. And every time there's a new story, they recycle that old story, because I remember Anya Citron Cern. Yep. So for years, the only thing that dominates Google, when you Google her name, is this, right? This is more powerful than any public reprimand in any jurisdiction across the country. Now, I am happy to report, because as I said, to the best of my knowledge, she's actually a fantastic attorney. Um, she is recovering, and as of uh, about a week ago, um, she had, this is actually a week ago, it's now starting to dissipate, and we're now starting to see more stuff that's relevant to her work. But this is the, what's scary and motivating attorneys to stay in line. So let's like kind of like get y'all to say, okay, we know him. If you don't know him in the news, you've seen him in the news. You understand what Aaron he's Aaron Schlossberg. But where do we go from here, right? Like, what's, the, what, what's next? How do we figure out how to, like, move forward? How do we really figure out how to practice ethics, you know, pra keep practicing while maintaining and, and abiding by the legal ethics and pushing them, right? So one of the things you want to do is get involved, right? Get on Twitter, get on Meetup, get on Facebook groups where people are actively having these discussions about how to do it, how to be creative around your practices, right? There's a disconnect. I'll tell you when I joined the legal tech community and like I tried to then have legal ethics conversations with my practitioner friends, they're like, I don't, like never legal ethics never come up. If you're a practitioner and you're hanging out with other practitioners, we're never talking about legal ethics. That's not the problem. Legal tech is obsessed with it and talking about it all the time. We need to bridge this gap. Part of the way we bridge this gap is we need to have a voice. These rules don't all make sense. Absolutely. We need practitioners to be talking about this more. Join meetup groups, join Facebook groups, share those stories. Join masterminds, like join things that allow you to have that, more, that broader conversation to think about your business, to be creative in your business, but then where you can have that legal hat, that ethics hat always be a part of your conversation. One of the other things is to embrace technology. I know we talked about read terms, get, you know, here are the, the fears about being a part of technology, but listen, I'm gonna sit here and tell you stop hating on LegalZoom. Embrace them. Why? Because everything they do, you can do too. Right? If they're proving the model, then you can go out there and say, how can I then innovate even beyond what they're doing? Because there's things that we can't do that they can't do, right? So like, be able to say, technology is there. It's going to make us better. How do we embrace it and keep moving on? Then, you know, get to the tools read. and read about where people are talking about these things. So it, we, can we can look stories. at our peers, like, This right? is interesting, fun, good break in your work. Go read the stories. Go to Above the Law. Read Lawyerist, Right Brain Law, ABA Journal. They're, oh, they are obsessed with these issues that the, my practice 
practitioner friends, it's just not on their radar, and I get it, because we're busy actually practicing law and actually learning the case law that's relevant to our practice, but we need to be engaged, because when we're not, we end up with regulations that don't make sense for people who are actually on the front lines, actually practicing the law, and not just talking about it. Um, and finally, one of the last things you can do is, uh, one of the projects that we're working on is data-driven ethics. And this is in part a way to collect information about what's actually happening on the ground, what is occurring between attorneys and clients. And, and also, what we're trying to do is get attorneys involved. Let's get engaged, let's start, there's power in numbers. The end, the end thing about this, and we want you guys to take away, is that we have to be a part of the conversation, right? Like the rules are there, they're always gonna be there, right? How do you navigate around them? Sometimes you're gonna stay within them, but sometimes, you know, you're gonna push forward. Forward. You're going to be like the innovators in our industry that is saying, we're not going to stick with the traditional model and we're going to push it beyond where it's at because that's what clients want, right? We want to start responding to what our clients want and go back to the, being the problem solvers that we are. So. so with that, thank you. And if you have any questions, we'll be sticking around if you want to talk.